right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to another session of the Kent Weekly Seminars here at ICP. Our presenter today, probably familiar to a lot of the people that are able to attend in person, it is Michael Winnick. He is a graduate student here at the university and is advised by Professor Tutumale. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois back in 2011, I believe, and has been working on his master's ever since. He is targeting finishing that up in this uh, coming May and has plans to then leave us and take his expertise out west where he's going to serve in the industry. Uh, something relatively closely related to the topic that he'll be presenting today, which is his work with railroad ballast. So please join me in welcoming Mike. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, as it's been said, I'm Mike Winnack. And uh, I'm here today to kind of tell you a little bit about uh, findings of a joint project between us and Union Pacific. That really quick, Jim. It's kind of the weird screen thing going on there. Anything you can do about that or before we get too far into it? Okay, just going to have to deal with it. Well, the fact that there's the box all the way. <laughs> before we get too far into it, but you know. Okay. All right, that's, that's fine. We'll deal with it. Okay, so anyway, I'd like to start by acknowledging a couple of my co-authors here. Obviously, my, my advisor, Professor Chetumler, uh, Mazur Moveni, another familiar face around here. Uh, he's done a lot of the image analysis uh, things for this project. And our contact at Union Pacific, Eric Geringer, he's been a, uh, a great guy to work with. Uh, asks all the right questions, is <laughs> so on and so forth. Great guy to work with. Uh, move on to the outline here. Uh, so we're going to start off going over the objectives and scope, uh, overview the experimental program, then uh, kind of move on to a move on to uh, ballast sources, properties, gradations, imaging properties from Im image or from aggregate image analysis, uh, shear strength, durability. Uh, we'll cover uh, single particle crush tests, which is uh, less so results and more so just kind of an introduction to a, a new test we're starting up. Permeability testing, we'll go over that, and then we'll go over both. Uh, some petrographic analyses and uh, particle shape properties, and of course, finish with conclusions as always. So this is a the objectives and scope of this project are to investigate the properties of premium aggregates influencing uh, ballast layer performance. Uh, premium aggregates here are uh, I apologize, there is a small error here, but the, the pretty much premium aggregates in this case is defined as either igneous rocks, e.g., granito granites, granitoids, trap rocks, and then metamorphic rocks. Uh, quartzites. Quartzites are not actually igneous rocks. Uh, the reason this kind of started up, UP observed high variation in their premium ballast materials. Uh, these are supposed to be really good stuff, and yet they're seeing very subpar performance. And Union Pacific spends uh, upwards of $50 million per year on ballast. So a lot of money going into something that's, in some cases, isn't performing very well. So they kind of wanted to see how they could get a little bit more bang for their buck. So uh, we will present kind of the findings of the initial scope of this research, and actually we're getting more towards the end scope of this research, so we'll leave them a little bit more. Uh, we'll compare various physical properties of the rock, shear strengths, degradation and particle crushing, and in addition move into some of the new things we've been testing, uh, such as permeability, and we'll also compare some, a little bit of the, petro the uh, petrography of the rocks. So our experimental program, I'll run through this really quick. You've got a lot of your basic ASTM lab tests, uh, specific gravity, gradation, Los Angeles abrasion, and then we've run some uh, non-ASTM lab tests, the image analysis of the aggregate properties, uh, the large direct shear testing, density and void ratio is measured a little bit differently. We measured in a, uh, actually with what I'll show you being the shear box, uh, after 55 seconds of vibratory compaction. Uh, this was found in the past by, I believe, uh, Huang, or uh, Hai, Hai, Hai Huang, who used to, be, used to be around here and is now a professor at University of Pennsylvania to simulate uh, kind of the in, in situ density of ballast. Doesn't get you your maximum density, but it's not exactly your uh, you know a minimum density either. So really quick, we had a uh, uh, 13 ballast suppliers from Union Pacific, plus a uh, fourth or a uh, 14th supplier that was uh, from the industry that wanted to be included in the test. So overall, we've done tests on 14 ballasts. And you'll kind of see it bouncing back and forth here because the 14th one came in a little bit late. A little bit late. We'll still present some of the, uh, the findings from that. Uh, your basic aggregate properties, I know most of you guys are going to know these, but I'll run through them really quick. Uh, you got your dry density, 
in this case, partially compacted density of the aggregate particles. Higher, higher means uh, denser packing, lower, lower, lower packing. Specific gravity, relative density of the aggregate particles themselves. Uh, void ratio, the ratio of the voids, uh, of the voids in the uh, aggregate matrix to the solid particles. So generally, if you have a high void ratio, you have more voids in, you have more voids in, your, ma in your matrix. Uh, so really quick, here's our density. You can kind of see it's all, it's somewhat uh, kind of, uh, it's similar. Your, our lowest there is around, uh, I think, 89 uh, pounds per cubic foot. Highest is up around uh, 115 or so. Specific gravity, we're, uh, we're all pretty similar there, but we're falling, our average is right about, I think, 2.49, 2.5, and we're going up to about 2.6, or 2.6, 2.7, uh, going down as low as uh, 2.2627. Void ratio, though, we've got a little bit more variation, and we're, we're pretty constant there in the 0.5 to 0.6 range with a couple outliers, namely <coughs> ballast 13 over here is, uh, has a very high void ratio, and that'll be one of several factors that we'll come back to later. So here's a rather, uh, this chart is a little, little clustered, and I apologize, that's what happens when you have 13 different materials and you have to try to fit them on one graph. But uh, you can see here, we, these, are, these are the gradations of all of our ballast materials. Uh, this one over here on the left, ballast 8, has kind of the, the highest percentage of large particles, whereas on the flip side here, ballast 13, highest percentage of small particles. Uh, that's, those are kind of some of the more notable ones that you can kind of see in there. Your specs here, though, are in the thick black dashed lines. You can kind of see how many aggregates are kind of are falling outside of that spec. That is one of uh, several reasons that Union Pacific started this project up, kind of look at some of, some of these properties and see whether even that gradation is a factor in this. The, uh, here's a kind of a table. And the main, you shouldn't really necessarily look at the, the numbers here. What the bigger thing to note is the, the colors, because the blue here indicates sieves that are passing spec, and orange is the opposite. It's not meeting spec. And there's quite a lot there. Uh, in this is uh, up here actually is the specification. It's uh, one that's specific to Union Pacific as opposed to uh, ARIMA. But it's similar to the ARIMA 24 specification, if you're familiar with that, a little bit more exacting, I guess, or a little bit more, uh, what's the phrase? It's, it's a little bit more tight on the specification. Uh, you can notice over here on the right side, the, the number 200 is one of the, probably the least met specs, though admittedly Union Pacific spec is pretty tight on that, only half, half percent passing. Uh, REMA spec is about 1%, and using that, only three of them aren't meeting that. But regardless, there's still a fair amount in here that are not meeting spec on multiple sieve sizes. With that, let's move on to the uh, aggregate image analysis. So this was done using the old University of Illinois Aggregate Image Analyzer, uh, henceforth referred to as the UIAIA, <coughs> or just the image analyzer. The, this takes pictures of the aggregate particles from three orthogonal views. Uh, we have three properties that are derived from this, uh, angularity index, flatten elongated ratio, and surface texture index. Now, uh, for all the results you'll see here, these values were found for 110 particles per ballast type and averaged. Uh, now, we have since th created this thing down here, which is called the Enhanced Image Analyzer. It has a little bit better technology, it has a lot better technology in it, and uh, is also better at just taking pictures of ballast particles in general. And we're currently in the process, nearly done with uh, finishing up, rescanning of all these particles with that. Imaging derived properties, there are three of them. I'm not gonna, we'll go uh, a little bit more into these, but roughly the, the basics of this here is that angularity index, it's the deviation of a particle shape from being a perfect circle. A higher, angular, a higher AI indicates a more angular aggregate. A lower AI indicates a more cubical or spherical aggregate. F and E ratio is pretty simple, just the ratio of the maximum to the minimum dimension of an aggregate <coughs> particle. A higher value indicates more flatness and elongation. A lower value indicates more uniformly shaped particles. Uh, surface texture index, this is the regularity of the surface of the aggregate particles. It, it's pretty much just a basic loss formula, and I'll show that in a second. But a higher STI is going to indicate a, a rougher aggregate, lower is going to indicate a smoother one. An angularity index, here's a little bit more detail on that. Uh, higher AI, it more, a more crushed face is lower AI, cubical or spherical. You can kind of see some examples here using, uh, 
you've got on one hand here kind of like a river, a river gravel, I believe is it, a river, river pit run or river gravel, very rounded from erosion. On the other hand, here you have ones with crushed faces and they're much more angular. Flat and elongated ratio, like I said, maximum to, minis to, to, maximum to minimum dimension. You're kind of measuring in three dimensions here. Service texture index, uh, basically you're doing erosion and dilation cycles on this. Pretty much what you do is you erode it and then dilate it to create a kind of an idealized particle surface. It's going to be smooth. And then you take the difference between, or the, the, the difference between that or the, the loss is, a, is in, uh, sorry, the loss is a percentage there between the two particles. And you can measure how rough or how smooth the particle is. So here's our values. A little, a lot, fair amount of variation here. Our lowest is down to about, I think, three in the 370s. Our highest is actually up there almost, exa I think, exactly at 600. So a lot more variation in your, your properties here with regards to shape. Uh, F and E ratio, we're seeing mostly uniform, but with the two or three exceptions here, as you can see. Ballast 13 in particular, that has the highest one at about uh, 3.8. It actually goes off the graph here because I wanted to show more detail here, but it goes up to about 3.7. Uh, the second other one here, Bell, is 6, is at about 3.4 or so, 3.45. And one thing to note on that one, that one is, we're a little, uh, we're in the process of rescanning. We think we might have uh, scanned too many small particles for that one, and we think that may have kind of increased our value there. So we'll, we'll see that, we expect that to go down in the future after we redo the test there. Service texture index, all over the place here. Uh, below one in some cases, meaning it's very, very smooth. And up to about 3.2, 3.3, or sorry, 3.1 or so. And very, very rough particles there. So shear strength test results. We tested, uh, uh, three, we tested at three normal pressures for shear strength to create a more coolant failure envelope. Now these, uh, these normal stresses were selected because they simulate the uh, confining pressure within a ballast section. Uh, one thing to note on these, for ballast, which is very open graded, there are no, barely any fines in here. Theoretically, you should have a cohesion intercept of zero. But uh, the reality is, when we, especially when we're doing a linear interpretation of this, we're getting what's called apparent cohesion. In reality, uh, these more Coulomb failure lines should be somewhere probably, I think, either logarithmic or exponential. And we're doing a, uh, a linear one because we're kind of far out, far, far away from that zero point. So here is our actual equipment. The, uh, this is our old one, and we're currently in the process of building a new one of these. But the basics you need to know here is this is where the normal pressure is applied via a bladder. We, can, we adjust the actual pressure there manually. The bottom box is, I believe it's 12 by 14, I believe. And I think it's about. Is that eight inches or so deep? The top box there, the shear, the, where the, actu the actual shearing is done, is 12 by 12. And I think it's about another three, four inches? Four inches. It's four inches. And we shear at a rate of 0.48 inches per minute. And we record up to about 15% maximum strain. Here's a better, little bit better graphic here to kind of help show the, how this all works. The bottom box there is actually stationary during testing. Or sorry, no. The top, yeah, the top box is stationary, and the bottom box is what it's what is what actually moves. So you have your shear plane between the two boxes, where you're pretty much measuring like the the definition of shear. It's two par two faces moving across one another. And after test, you've moved for moved it pretty much to the end of the box there. It's about 15 percent strain. Here's all of our results. A little hard to interpret here, but what you want, but in general, higher is better. On this, and it's a little bit qualitative because of the kind of different that you can have different uh, friction angles and so on and so forth. But in general, the highest one we, we called ballast A, which was the the 14th addition to the, the project, a very strong trap rot from up near up in Ontario. Lowest, as I, I've said several, I think I've mentioned ballast 13 several times. Ballast 13 here, very weak. It's <laughs> our worst ballast by a long shot. This is just a little bit easier to look at here. I kind of I eliminated the data points to just see the more Coulomb failure envelopes. Once again, you've got this guy here, which is your strongest, your weakest, everything else in between. 
a little bit, even a little bit, e little bit easier. We've now narrowed it down to a single confining, or a, th a single interpolated, interpolated normal stress. In this case, uh, this is at 25 psi, your middle range, and we've got some high ones. Ballast A here is the highest at a uh, pretty high, about about 40, be about 44 or so psi. Ballast 13 all the way down at about it's about 22. 22 psi? 24? Sorry, wait, no. <laughs> Can't read. Uh, about 28 or so, I think. Highest, like I said, ballast A. Lowest, ballast 13. Pretty high variation there. So as we stated at the beginning, U Union Pacific had observed this in track, actually. Pretty high variation in their ballast materials. Uh, so one area where we found some good correlation, or somewhat decent correlation relative to <laughs> everything else we looked for correlations in, was with the... Uh, Void ratio, actually. Uh, in general, there was a decreasing trend between it and uh, shear strength. But as you can see, not a, not a great trend. Still kind of bouncing all over the place. So here's some highlights, as we said. Uh, actually, besides uh, or one of the notable ones that we found, like I said, we are currently reinvestigating this, is that is ballast 6. If you come back to here, ballast 6 is actually our third highest strength right there. And yet, you recall it had the very high F and E ratio. So either this is a absurdly strong mineralogy in this rock, or maybe those maybe this, those small particles are throwing off. Remains to be seen. Regardless, it's a pretty impressive uh, impressive that it pulled off that high strength. Strongest aggregate before ballast A was added, ballast ten, uh, it was a cyanide mm -hmm. composition, notable because it was the only one. Uh, lowest of the lowest F and E ratio though. Ballast thirteen, on the other hand. Uh, that was our weakest, had the highest F and E ratio, highest void ratio also, smallest, or smallest percentage of small particles. A lot, of, lot going against it, and it's, it's, it's very much showing in the test results. Uh, one thing we did find, strength was pretty much independent of density. And as I stated, we saw decreasing strength with increasing void ratio. Uh, now, durability testing. We used uh, a Los Angeles abrasion machine for this. We tested it uh, 400 and 1,000 turns. Uh, research by uh, Bowler, Tumler, and Winnack in uh, 2012 suggested that at 400 turns, granite aggregates became well graded, actually. And so that's why we chose 400 turns out of the any number of turns we could have chosen between 400 and 1,000. Durability reporting, we had three or four different indices we could have reported in. Your basic LAA number, which is the ASTM or suggested reporting, which is just your loss as a percentage of the original sample, where loss is material passing number 12 sieve. Fouling index, which the fouling index and fouling content are, what's called, are, are what are usually referred to as the Selig indices, uh, created by uh, Dr. Ernie Selig, who was uh, kind of the leader in ballast research up through the 90s or so, up through the early 2000s. He created fouling index and fouling content. Uh, fouling index, sum up for the percentage passing the number 4 and 200 sieves. And fouling content, which was the ratio of the material passing the 3 eighths inch, 3 eighths inch sieve to the dry weight of the sample. From these three, we just simply average them to create what we call ballast degradation index, or BDI. All three indices were described as a percentage. The lower value describes a more durable aggregate for all three. So it was a simple matter just to average all three of them. Here's an LAA machine, if you haven't seen one. A machine turns with the aggregate and 12 steel balls for the specified number of turns. And here's all, our, here's all the results. A uh, little, bit, little bit of variation there for both 400 and 1,000, or a decent amount, actually. Highest here. Ballast 5 was the most durable aggregate overall across both 400 and 1,000 turns. Weakest was pretty much a tie between ballast 10 and, ball and ballast 12. Uh, one of them was the lowest at, or had the high, or lowest durability at 400, and the other one was lowest at 1,000. So they about average out, and they're both about the weakest there. Durability testing highlights at 400 turns, our best was ballast 5, worst was ballast 12. 1,000 turns, the best is ballast 7, worst is ballast 10. Average, as I just said, average, as I just said best is ballast 5, worst, ballast 10, and 12. And we think there's some further explanations may lie within the more petrographic analyses of the rocks, especially doing like hardness testing. Uh, so here we go, single particle crush test. We just got these underway a week, week or two ago. So we don't have any results to show just yet, but we want to at least go over it. So this is something new we've started. This is a... Literally, as, as the name suggests, you are crushing a single particle of rock in a compression, te compression testing machine. Uh, we're using the, the Forney machine down at 
uh, Newmark for testing. And these actually test the indirect <coughs> tensile strengths of the rock. Uh, you need to select your particles actually such that they do not fail in bending. So you have to make sure that you have kind of two, two, roughly two contact points only, one on each side, as opposed to maybe having, if you had a rock that was kind of like this, you'd have three contact points and you'd actually be failing the specimen in bending as opposed to in tension. So one thing you need though it, uh, during these tests is an area to compute your actual uh, strength. Now there are a couple ways to do it. From the original studies I have read, they've done it a bit with by simply taking the end result rock, the final rock, putting it through, manually putting it through sieves until they find what it's retained on. They take that, that size and they square it, assuming it's just a square particle for simplicity's sake. Now, we read through this, through this and said, well, we've got something a little cooler than that. We have, I mentioned that enhanced image analyzer. That can actually measure the rocks more exactly, as opposed to with sieves, where you can get maybe a resolution of a half an inch in either direction. For this, we can measure pretty exact what the size of the rock is. So rather than saying, OK, it's 1.5, we can now say it's 1.4, or 1.36, so on and so forth. Way to, get, way to get a little bit more exact answers. And as I mentioned, these tests are currently underway. Hopefully, we'll start getting results very, very soon. So with that, we're going to move on to the ballast permeameter. Uh, which is the most kind of the most recent portion that's still underway, but we're about halfway done with. First, let's give a little background here. Uh, ballast and perme permeability is a little bit uh, interesting thing. Ballast is very, very open graded, uh, has huge voids in it, and so water going through it goes through pretty quickly. Om sometimes almost like there's nothing there. But first, let's go over a couple things. Rel relevant ASTM specifications. Uh, so. They have, there is a spec for constant head permeability test for large, coarse grain soils. More specifically, it specifies constant head as opposed to falling head, and specifies a diameter 8 to 12 times your nominal max aggregate size. No, there is no commercial product available that can meet that 8 to 12 times requirement. Uh, we, for the majority of our aggregates, it's roughly a 1.5 inch nominal max size. That for that lower spec at 8, 8 times, I believe that gets us right up to about 12 inches. The largest available we could find was nine inches. So, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, very open graded, very open graded. You need very high flow rates through this to measure the difference. I mentioned Selig earlier in the uh, durability section. Uh, they're kind of the last ones we could find that had done any major permeability testing of ballast, and they actually used a 15 foot, foot tall falling head permeameter to measure this. So, pretty high, really high. In fact, I think we, we looked into this originally, and I don't think we could find a spot in Atrial that would have fit this thing, <laughs> even with the high base. Mm -hmm. So we needed to find a way to test this. We needed a large setup due to the open graded, graded nature of ballast. <coughs> needed a high flow rate. So we reconstructed a large constant head permeameter. This was originally built at here, UIUC, in the late 80s by, uh, some of you may know him, he's face around here, Professor Barry Dempsey, and uh, his student James Corvetti, who's now a professor up at Marquette. Uh, they used it actually to measure the permeability in open graded highway base courses, which are also very, very permeable. And this was literally sitting in, had been sitting in the back, I think over in TOL for who knows how long, just kind of rusting away because the testing had finished up 15 years ago. And we went through and we kind of redesigned and refurbished the permeameter into working order, and we've updated it for more uh, sustainable and convenient operation. And actually, Barry Dempsey, who's still around here, helped us out a lot during that, giving us, filling us in on how they, or how the machine used to be back when it was running. And we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of help from him. He's been great help for that. So here's kind of what we had in mind for it. Uh, this was our kind of first drawing of what the overall setup would look like. And so here, you, this is the main, this big piece here, it's the main permeameter. We added on uh, this, flow, this flow channel to it, collection basin. Back there, there's a pump. We had to put it up on stilts to get it to feed water into that collection basin. And uh, it's not pictured here, but there's also, we also had a, the, there was what's called a stilling well, which is where you measure the flow at the end. And uh, for some reason, that went missing. We don't know how it went missing, but <laughs> it did. And here it is. This is it about a month or two ago. It's running. If you've been over at uh, NMPF, the, you've seen this big monstrosity back there. It's about, its total setup length is about 17 feet long. The permeameter itself is about 10 feet, is about 5 feet tall, 
10 feet long, and it's propped up about another good foot or two in the air. It's a, it's a pretty big setup, and we, we pump a lot of water through that. Uh, so some setup details. Per permeter length is about 10 feet. Setup length, 17 feet. Sample length, 2 feet. Flow area is about uh, 1 square foot. Flow is measured by the height above a V-notch weir plate at the end. That uh, By measuring that height, there is an equation you can use to get the actual flow through it in uh, cubic feet per second. And we've got a variable speed pump at the end, which allows us to kind of fine tune either to establish equilibrium in the system if need be, or to establish different hydraulic gradients for the system to test at. So really quick, the testing, I'm not going to go too much into this, but your basic procedure for this, you're mixing about uh, 200 pounds worth of aggregate together first. Since we've got it stored in buckets, we mix it together first. We place the aggregate in uh, three equal li lifts, compacting to no settlement. Then we soak the sample for 24 hours to get all the, the uh, air voids out. Then we test uh, for, with the pump between 1,100 and uh, 2,750 RPMs every 250 starting at 1,250 RPMs. The reason we have it at 1,100 RPMs is because that's the first point at which we can uh, kind of establish an equilibrium and get constant uh, head heights there without it kind of reaching the overflow point within the system. Uh, we test the same sample twice under two different compactions. Uh, for the first test, we empty the sample out, recompact it, put it back in, and we've uh, observed a coefficient of variation less than 10% for all samples. This is uh, the Actually, it's much less. I think we're under 5%. And uh, Professor Dempsey, uh, who did, did the original testing, informed me that that's the highest variation they saw for the same sample compacted twice. Uh, this is just due to uh, different flow paths within the actual sample itself because you've got this very, as I mentioned, open-graded nature, and you've got ballast, which is kind of an can be a very anisotropic material. It, uh, you compact it two different ways. It'll have different heights, so on and so forth, two different flow rates. And uh, the other thing we want to note is that the second compaction does not cause noticeable degradation in the sample. Here's our, our proof for that. We've got in red the, the after testing and the black before. And as you can see, those lines are falling pretty much directly on top of one another. So we, we, we're getting, this is also uh, ballast 12, which if, if you recall was one of our, weak, our least durable materials. So if we would have seen any degradation, it would have been with this one. Uh, really quick, flow theory. You've got your, uh, I'm sure all of you have taken fluid dynamics. Q equals, Q, or even, uh, or, or geotech, or something along those lines. Uh, Darcy's law is our basic, is uh, what we're using here. Q equals KIA, your, you got your flow, measured by the flow height above B-notch weir. You got your, your K, hydraulic conductivity, which is pretty much your permeability that we're measuring. Hydraulic gradient, your head difference divided by specimen length, and then your specimen area. Here's a little bit of a, a flow demonstration here with a uh, cutaway of the permeameter. You've got water here in the collection basin. It gets cycled up through here into the upstream tank here, goes through the sample, which is inside here and held in place, and we've cordoned off the sides to make sure that all the flow is going through the sample itself. Comes up and over the, what's, what's the plexiglass insert here, and we've got some flexibility to adjust the, the flow height down here, but we've been testing at a pretty low delta H right now because it, it has to do, once again, with that open graded nature. If you drop it, below about, uh, I know I've tested it about a nine inch flow height and it can, it can barely reach this overflow point here, which is what you need to, to do really to test for that constant head. Comes over here, flows out here. There's a V-notch weir here. That's where we measure our flow height through a stilling well on the side. That's how we, and that's how we get all, our, all of our uh, properties there. So here's what we've tested so far. We've got about, we're about halfway done or so. You can, as you can see, for the ones that we've gotten that second run done for, pretty pretty close results. So pretty low coefficient of variation. We're, we're pretty happy with the results at the moment. We're seeing very high flow rates, which we expect. Uh, in the ranges of, uh, I think our lowest, lowest one we've run is not on here because it was not a, uh, it was a, one of the first tests we ran, but it was around 11,000 uh, feet per day. Highest we've tested is up at about the 17,000 mark or so. So here's just kind of an example raw result. We're testing uh, about eight different hydraulic gradients v by adjusting the flow rate through the system with the pump. And we, we much just go across here. What you ex should expect is a roughly a flat line across there, because in theory, your conductivity should stay the same regardless of flow. 
And we see two different results, which we expect, but we're seeing relatively flat, ex we, we're seeing relatively flat results. Same, with, same here, here's just another example. You can see with pretty much when we increase the pump speed, we're getting an increased hydraulic gradient. So here's our example of permeability versus void ratio. Now at the moment, as you can see, we've got a very, uh, not a, a great R squared. Not really the worst I've seen, but it's not great. But you also notice this guy right here. This single, all these ones here are kind of in a nice line, and then there's this one. Now, I'm calling that an outlier. Here's why. This guy right here, this, or that's ballast eight right there, which, as I mentioned earlier, has the largest percentage, or highest percentage of large particle, particles. Also has the highest angularity. So, in the third reason, we can, I'm calling this an outlier and I'm okay eliminating this right now. It's because if we, if we want to use this equation for prediction, we're estimating low. We'll estimate underneath what we want to. So we've got a safety factor in there. So if we do that, we eliminate that single point, suddenly we jump up to a very high R squared and a very good relation like we expect to see. So we, we did want to check for a couple other things. We thought maybe angularity might play a large role in this. As, well, what we see is, as you can see from our R squared, we are not seeing any kind of any, uh, ver any uh, correlation with angularity index. So then we thought maybe we'd combine it with something. So we combined it with void ratio. We multiplied the two together. And we saw something OK, not great. But we are, we are, our end goal is to be able to account for that one outlier in the original void ratio. So we're going to keep messing around and seeing what we can find in terms of correlations there. So a future permeability work, we want to compare it with the, uh, what's called the Cosinet-Karman equation. It's, uh, if you're familiar with the Hassan equations for estimating permeability, which just incorporate, I think, D60, D10, D30. Uh, this one's a little bit better. Uh, it was developed in the 50s, so it's about half the age of the Hassan equation. And it's a little bit better at dealing with large, larger particles. It takes into account a lot more factors, too. Uh, you're, you've got your basic visco unit weight, viscosity, specific surface area, which we're going to obtain, actually, once again, with the enhanced image analyzer. Me can measure the actual surface area of the particles. And then your void ratio. Uh, the second thing, we're hoping, this is still, we'll see how much time, as, as mentioned, I'm graduating in May, so this may happen after I leave, but uh, follow testing of selected ballast samples. We'd like to t do that to see what our reduction in permeability is. So uh, the last two areas we're going to cover is a quick petrograph, going kind of over a little bit of petrographic examination. Now, we're not going to go hugely in detail in terms of petrography. We're not going to go into the, too much into the specific rock types. We're going to kind of break it down into three basic categories here. Granitoid, trap rock, and quartzites. Granitoids are, have a large grain size. They're igneous, intrusive rocks. Trap rocks are igneous, extrusive rocks. And you've got quartzites, which are granular metamorphic rock. Uh, petrography, I should actually clarify, though, is a branch of geology that specializes in the description of rocks, both macro and microscopically. And uh, we are going to do, as for future work, we are going to go a little bit more into petrography very soon. We're going to examine uh, one class of rock, which is called, they're called rhyolites, specific trap rock type. We've got three of them, ballast 2, 9, and 13. Uh, and uh, I'll go a little bit more into this. But we want to do a microscopic examination and miner miner a specific mineralogical analysis of these. And we also, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, durability section, we want to do rock hardness via Mo Mohs hardness, which is a simple, uh, not very, it's not exactly qualitative, but it's, not as qu quantitative as, say, like Brunel hardness or something, but it's quick and it's easy and it's pretty accurate. And, oh, and to note down here for the next couple of graphs, here's kind of your key for the different rock types because I have them labeled in the graphs. So here's kind of our angularity index values uh, for tra trap rocks, granites, quartzites, and then this one here, which is a mix of granite and trap rock, actually. And as you can kind of see, I, I didn't bother with the quartzites because we only have one of them. I ignored this guy or the, uh, the mixed one for all these. And I averaged them all. And we have the trap rocks are showing a little higher angularity overall than the granites, but not too much. 474 versus 458. So that means, I guess, first off the, or we're not, in this case, we're not seeing too much of a difference between the rock type differences, but too much difference between the rock types and the angularity, which indicates that they're not necessarily crushing too much differently. F and E, we're seeing a little bit more variation, but not too much. Uh, Granitoids, 1.93. Trap rocks, 2.29. Now, I did want to make sure we also ran a calculation without ballast 13, which is what was our highest one in trap rock and kind of not exactly an outlier, but it's 
kind of an unusual one relative to the rest of the trap rocks. In that case, the drop.
<laughs> All right. So the question was about uh, the, the following content indices. So I think you said, you, as you make sure I got the question right, because you, you have seen following index more often, correct? Uh, I believe following content is especially uh, mainly used with regards to the undercutting operations, because under the under oh, so undercutting ballast cleaner, it actually scoops up the ballast underneath the track, s uh, washes it, sieves it, and puts it back in track. Now the main the, the what they sieve is the passing three eighths inch. That's what following content is. It's passing three eighths inch. So that's what if you put that through an undercutter. That percentage, I believe, is roughly what you would get rid of during the cleaning operation. I believe that's where the or the, the origin of that that specification or that uh, in index is. Many many people would consider anything below three eighths of an inch to be not useful ballast, in fact, in terms of ballast conservation. So, uh, Professor Ernie uh, said it actually that that percent fouling it's also called percent fouling content, not fouling content. So he just just to give a very And if you're not familiar, I guess I'd say we've talked about Ernie, Se Dr. Ernie Selig. He's a kind of the the kind of has written the defining text for at the moment on railroad geotechnology uh, back in the '90s. And he at, was at University of Massachusetts Amherst. He was a, since retired, but he was very very well known for his uh, many many ballast tests and sub ballast tests and subgrade tests. So, any other questions, Aaron? Yes. Do you foresee? Well, uh, if, if there is a relationship there, does permeability become of equal importance to loss of structural capacity, for example? Yes, because interesting. This is not. Um, I don't have this in here, but there has been a test actually that went along with that original study by Bowler, Tumler, and myself, where they did to it. They did a single couple, single test of a fouled uh, sample, and I believe it was actually at 400 turns, and then they have to see for my original results we tested we had the the clean result and interestingly the the foul ballast actually had a higher shear strength now that was that was tested dry as soon as you wet that you're obviously going to lose that strength the the second thing you got to worry about is uh, kind of a, the the washout so to speak in during uh, one of the reasons for open graded ballast is to quickly get water away from the tracks prevent either washout scenarios where you lose capacity rapidly, or well, pretty much you just want to drain water away from the track very quickly. You've got, a lot, in a lot of areas, you've got wooden ties, or you've got, even got concrete in there, and then you've got metal components sitting above that, neither of which are very, uh, they don't like water. <laughs> and so you want to get rid of that water as quick as possible to keep your track in as good a shape as possible. So I'm not sure, I think I'm getting a little off track there, but. <laughs> But um, so but but perhaps your disappointment might be your answer actually raised another question. Yes. Uh, regarding the permeometer. Yes. You were using. What what screen size do you use for the, the basket that's going to be for the for the clean ballast? We're using about a number eight screen on the outside right now. Um, we have a very very small percentage below that passing the number eight. As well, I think we. Let me see if I have that in here still. You knew in the original ballast, but what about when it becomes foul? Do you have once it once it becomes foul, we're we going to change screens. Uh, we have the ability to change out. All we have to do is get a new screen made by our, by our machine shop and just pull out the other one, drop it right in. And do you, do you foresee it going to something like Dr. Chef mentioned, anything lower than 3 8 You know, it's going to set your screen size at that. So mm -hmm. if you're using a foul ballast, it has the potential to wash away some of that. We, uh, we int probably intend to go down. We're, we're not sure exactly what we'll use yet. I've heard, I think, uh, another guy, another of our research Graduate research assistant Hassan and I have discussed possibly using a number forty screen on it, and because to get, keep most of that material in, uh, we're not sure if we want to use number two hundred because that's fair, you know fair, <laughs> at that point you're going to have the screen probably affecting permeability as well. Right. Well, I guess I raised the, the question just as more thinking out loud than anything. Yep. But as your material degrades, 
in the field, you're talking about washouts, but as a material, you grade, you stand a chance of losing some of this lower quality material as it's going to find and find and make its way through the, the matrix of your, your ballot. Yep. So do you want to retain all of that, even in the case of permeability, or do you let some of that actually wash away, giving you the fines? more representative results, perhaps? That's a good question, and I'm not sure I, I can answer that, because then if you ever go out and look out at a regular layer check, you won't really, you, something that's in really bad shape, you, you will not see fines because, like you said, they all, they're going to wash down to the bottom after your first rain. And that's, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, that's, uh, it'd be a pretty hard question to find out and answer, but it is a good point, which is that in real life, you're going to have all those fines go to the bottom and you're going to lose some, of, some of those fines are just going to wash right out. So I know when I'm doing the actual, like the clean testing, I'm not worried about those at all. I, I mean, I actually run the machine a little quicker at first to kind of make sure we get rid of those fines early on, make sure we're testing clean, you know, completely clean ballots. Not that I, for such small amounts, I expect it to really affect the results either way, but. Oh, it, it does, it does. Oh yeah. So that, that yep. Well, and permanent de probably as you know, triaxial permanent deformation is probably the best way to do your testing, but it's also very time intensive, even more so than doing the shear box testing. So I think that's why we opted. I, I'm guessing I wasn't going to. Professor Tom was going to put the project plan together, and but I'm guessing that's why he chose shear box testing, as opposed to permanent deformation. Deb can vouch for how long that takes. <laughs> So the, the question was, uh, you, obviously, as Union Pacific was ob observing hi high variation, how and how did uh, how did they observe that, and how do our results correlate? Yeah, how did they measure it within the, in performance? Is it your kind of study now? The uh, as opposed to uh, measuring how. I'm not sure they they do have a, uh, a large scale test going on in I believe Nebraska right now, ca uh, called uh, it's in conjunction with the Transportation Technology Center in Pueblo. And it's got four, actually there's three of the, there's four ballasts in there, I think. Or four, is it, or is it five? five. It's One five. Control, and uh, I think three or four of those are the same ones tested here. And I, don't, I know ballast 13 was one of them for sure, and I forget the other two off the top of my head. But that's one way they're observing it is, because, is through by measuring settlement there. The other way is just general, your basic qualitative field reports from the field maintenance personnel. They're getting from their roadmasters and such, they're, they've heard, some of these are not doing, or they're, they're complaining that they're not doing well, or that they'll run a gradation test and they'll see that, the, especially I know with the gradation test, they get, they're able to observe that they were not meeting specification. So that's, that's how they observed it. Now for correlation, uh, we have seen it for some, of, for some of the ones that I guess that matter the most, which namely especially is ballast 13, with the exception of durability, dur within measuring durability. Ballast 13 we observed had the highest, or low, sorry, lowest strength, Horrible flatten along gauge ratio is n not very good. Now, as I mentioned earlier, LIA, uh, some notable issues with it that have been known about for quite a while with regards to predicting performance. And that can also be seen in the results. Actually, with that part of it can be seen in the results. So from a pure durability standpoint, it doesn't do too bad. Um, the second thing to note, I guess, with regards to, to matching the results here to field performance is that uh, part of our, up in our group's research, this is headed by Deb and Hassan, They've, those five ballast materials we mentioned being tested are being modulus tested here at University of Illinois. And they've observed similar, tre or similar trends, and especially, once again, for ballast 13, where they're observing not great modulus and, and uh, pretty bad permanent deformation of the material. So. The, other, the other question that has to do with the question, <coughs> uh, crushing strength of the individual aggregate. Yes. Uh, just seeing the particle that you showed me, the compression at a very sharp point. Now, uh, when we try to test the compressive strength of concrete, we, we take great pains to make sure we have smooth surfaces. Yep. 
how much does the uh, variation of the uh, aggregate uh, itself affect the expression of strain? We don't know that just yet, but we do know that I think, as I mentioned, you got to be. You can't just randomly pick particles out of, a, out of the, the sample. You actually have to go through the particles and say, okay, this particle, we can put it this way, and it will have two contact points within it. And because otherwise, like I mentioned, you can have, you can have issues with breaking in uh, bending as opposed to, ten to, I guess, indirect tension like you want. Or you could break, break any other number of ways depending on how you have that orientation, that how your contact surfaces are. So you want to have to make sure you pick out the right particles for a star. And that's why we, were, we had initially discussed looking at taking these particles and examining their shape properties before, before we did the testing and then after. But after some discussion, we decided that because of the way we have to select these particles, we decided that that would not be a good way to kind of observe that because we have to be very selective in, the, in our particles and you know, we're going to get the more, I guess, in general, we're going to get more, the more cubical particles within, within a sample even for the highly angular aggregates. But no, there are going to be, there's going to be different effects for each of them. Um, you know, these are, <laughs> these will break, from the, the tests, the practice tests we've done with these, they break many different ways. No two particles will break the same way twice. Uh, sometimes you get a perfect split in half. Sometimes you get, you know, pieces that will flake off the edge and edge until finally you've got reached your max, uh, your max force. It's, it's very much, you're definitely getting variation there. Uh, we are testing, because I'm, I'm on a deadline for graduation and such at the moment, <laughs> uh, we're testing uh, 10, we're testing across three sieve sizes, namely three quarter inch, one inch, and 1.5 inch for the majority of the samples. We're testing 10 particles each. Uh, the original study we found, I think they tested six particles with 30 particles per sieve size. So for now, we're starting off with 10 particles per sieve size and then once we've got those, then we'll start expanding more and say, okay, here's another 10 particles. Let's go expand it a little bit more and build up our database. But the hope, kind of the reason, one of the reasons we're doing this is, A, you know, we always like to find an area for, look for more cor correlations with either strength results or such. The second reason, and this is my own kind of personal goal is, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned with, with regards to kind of the LAA tests and such, that those were not showing a good indication of strength. The hard part is now finding something that will correlate with field performance. And that was also can be run relatively easily. Um, you know, the shear strength root tests, not too many of those machines around, and they're rather expensive to build as we're finding out to build our new one. Uh, permanent deformation, even more expensive and even longer to run. Uh, LEA not showing us really anything, you know, necessarily, I don't, I don't hesitate to say completely useless, but it's not correlating well with field performance. So this, this is something that we're kind of hoping might show some good correlation with either field performance or just performance in general. In, instead of the uh, strength testing, would you continue a hardness test on the aggregate? We, at, not at the time, but we are going to, uh, I guess I mentioned we're going to do most hardness on all the rocks anyway. Uh, it's mainly going to be for the durability side, but we'll, I mean, as long as we got the strength <coughs> data right there. <laughs> uh, Brunel would obviously probably be the best, but that's more intensive and you'd have to go and Mose is just quick. You buy a quick test set. You get little like, testing pens. You just go scratch, and you pretty much just put them on a graph from there. Uh, Brunel, you'd have to. I'd have to get down to the geology lab, cut a couple sections of rock out for thirteen different rocks, and test them at you know ten points per rock or something like that. I, I don't know exactly, but it's more intensive. Mose will give us. It's it's pretty reliable, and will still give us our, our basic uh, kind of a relative measure of the of the hardness of the rocks. Any other questions? Thank you guys very much.